Hello and welcome to GDC 2021. This is our live AMA Q&A with Global Game Jams, Kate Edwards. That was a lot of letters all at once. I'm Joel Couture, Editor-in-Chief of Indie Games Plus. I'll be the moderator for this session. My pronouns are he, him, and I am ridiculously excited to announce Kate Edwards. If you've got a ton of questions for her, let's rock. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me here. It's great. Um, as a, as a longtime participant in GDC, um, this is a little bit different from what I'm used to, but uh, that's great. So um, absolutely. Yeah, let's, let's get moving on this. Very cool. So I'm going to jump right in before anybody else has any questions, because I'm lucky and I can do that. <laughs> what first interested you in bringing your geographer experience to be, into video games? Because that's, that sounds really interesting to me. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was really kind of a mistake, a happy mistake, because I, you know, like many people in my generation who are, you know, above 50 or in our, you know, up there, uh, more veteran status, I guess, um, we didn't game design and game, you know, creating games, there's not really a clear career path you know, coming out of high school or in the college days. So for me, I basically pursued what I was interested in, which was, you know, wanting to be an astronaut, wanting to be an artist for Lucasfilm because I wanted to work on Star Wars um, and then eventually settled on geography and cartography because I've always had this incredible interest in cultures and travel and maps and everything. And plus the artistic, artistic skill I had, I could use with cartography. And so basically to make a really long story short, I pursued that field and I'm really happy I did. Um, it's been fantastic. And I ended up doing my graduate school work at the University of Washington in Seattle. And I just finished my master's degree, which was focused on using VR for cartography. That was way back in 1991. And Microsoft called our department and said they needed a cartographer to work on a card encyclopedia, which some people out there might remember. And so I went over to Microsoft on what I thought was going to be like a really short-term contract uh, to work, be a cartographer and, you know, basically help uh, create the maps for the initial version of Encarta. Well, that turned into a longer and longer contracts and eventually a full-time position. And I, um, in that full-time role, which was still initially mainly focused on the cartography in like uh, Encarta World Atlas, Encarta Encyclopedia, Streets and Trips, like all the mapping products that Microsoft was doing. I did um, get asked by the flight sim team at one point. They're like, hey, you know, you're, you're a cartographer. We need some help with some advice on this. Um, but where it really started for me when I really started working on games was I created a, an internal team at Microsoft uh, called Geopolitical Strategy because I noticed that the company was having struggles with maintaining knowledge around like what is sensitive from a political standpoint or cultural standpoint um, in the content that they were producing. And so like, you know, the office team would make a mistake in one market and then, you know, another product group who does, you know, completely across the company would make a similar mistake. And then they get in all this really big trouble with the government because, you know, they were making these mistakes. And so I basically determined that this is a weakness. And so there needs to be a group that coordinates that kind of knowledge across the company. So once I created that team, that was way back in 1998, um, that also gave me the mandate to work on all Microsoft products, including all the games. So I started working on all the PC uh, stuff back then, like all the Age of Empires and, you know, Asheron's Call and all those kinds of games, MechWarrior. And then of course we got into the early Xbox, um, you know, cause the Xbox at that at initially wasn't there yet. Um, but then I ended, got to basically work on all of those Microsoft franchises, um, Halo, you know, obviously, uh, Fable, Forza, all of that stuff. And that's when I really found like, this is my calling. I get to do what I call culturalization work on video games. So it's basically this incredible confluence of everything I love, technology, creative media, games, uh, geography, cartography, all of this stuff came, came together in a really strange way. And I'm so thankful that it did. And uh, I love what I do. Yeah, it sounds like it's really interesting work and uh, it works to well to all your interests. Um, and if the audience has any questions, feel free to jump in, throw those in the chat. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep taking over the whole talk because I'm super <laughs> I want to keep pushing for it. Can you tell us some of the do you have some interesting stories on the, your work with like Halo or Call of Duty or any of those? 
Oh yeah, there's there's a lot of stories. I mean, probably one that's um, that has become I've used this in some of my lectures. Is one that um, that caused a lot of uh, problems is, is we had one game that probably a lot of people have never heard of or don't remember called Kakudu Chojin, which was on the original Xbox. It was like a hand to hand fighting game, and um, the problem is that the game included a initially included an audio file that had uh, chanting from the Quran. So it was. You know, I do voice. remember this. Yeah. So it was. Hard to hear up, but. Yeah. No. Exactly. So it was chanting lyrics from the Quran, which they, you know, basically that's probably that's not appropriate to have in a game in that kind of context. And so, you know, when I raised the concern, you know, it was it was brought to me, um, and then I verified it with someone who was uh, you know, who was in my building, who's actually originally from Kurdistan, and so he's like, yeah, he's like, this is going to be a big problem. I'm like, yeah, I figured that. So, um, basically, the decision was made to fix it right away, but the problem was that we already had actual copies of the game already printed and literally rolling on their way to stores. And so the challenge then is like, what are we supposed to do with all those copies that are out there? And of course, my decision was just destroy them. I mean, recall them and just, you know, we'll make new ones because for a company like Microsoft, it's not that expensive, you know, to redo that. But the decision was made to go ahead and release only the U.S. because the feeling was that it should not be a big issue, even though. As a geographer, I'm like, did you know that there's, you know, eight or nine million Muslims in the United States? Did you know that like Detroit's 50% Muslim? It's like we are not a homogeneous society here. So there are people in this country who are going to be, you know, who are going to notice this. And I was told, don't worry about it. So basically, you know, and the, the decision was kind of a convoluted decision. I'm not going to go into how that was made, but basically um, we eventually got a, because the game did release, um, we did get a, a letter from the government of Saudi Arabia that basically was telling us that this was a huge problem and it became front page news in the Middle East um, really rapidly. It really started to explode in the region as a, as a negative piece of news. And so I eventually was asked by the head of the Middle East region of Microsoft to come over there and basically help do damage control because I, as a geographer and in the role I served uh, at Microsoft, I knew you know, the complex issues behind it and why this is gonna be sensitive. So they said, it'd be great if somebody from headquarters like you could come over and actually explain what's going on and what happened. And so I did. And I ended up going to Riyadh and I landed in Riyadh two days before the second Gulf War started. So that was exciting. So exciting's a word for it. <laughs> you know, and I didn't really, I wasn't really thinking about it. Obviously, I was aware of what was going on in the world, but at the same time, I'm like, well, that's my job. I need to go there and do this. And um, so what was fascinating is that, you know, I sat in front of representatives of the religious council of the of the Saudi government to explain to them what happened. And it was um, to say it was a bit uncomfortable is an understatement. But basically, I, to shorten the story, you know, that I basically explained to them what happened and, you know, they they accepted the, the apology and then we just moved on. Then I went over to Dubai and had to do something similar, even though, you know, the UAE is a more liberal culture within, within the region. So it wasn't quite as stringent there. But the point being is that one audiophile that somebody did not check, that nobody asked, like, what are these lyrics? What where was this from? All because of that, the game, the game eventually was globally recalled um, because it just was so caustic. It, it created so such negative PR. And um, yeah, it was unfortunate. It actually showed up on eBay for a while, like, hey, banned video game. You know, actually the price was was uh, fairly high at one point, but then of course it immediately dropped. But <laughs> so that was that was just one example of many, many kinds of challenges in this space that you have to deal with because, you know, choices have consequences and we have to be super careful about what we're, you know, putting in games, even though, you know, the developers said, well, we put it in there because it sounds cool. And I agree, it does sound cool. It's a beautiful lyrics. It's a beautiful music to listen to, but the context is just not appropriate. Yeah, you definitely have to keep these things in mind. And it's good that there's folks like you are working to kind of like be at the forefront of this stuff. Um, how do you stay up to date on uh, what's going on in the world for your culturalization work? Uh, that's one of the questions we had in the chat. 
That is a great question. What I do is I read a lot of stuff. I also have mm-hmm. a lot of uh, search alerts that I've set up that are like customized um, that uh, yeah, basically inform me on a daily or weekly basis. So I'm basically constantly getting stuff in my inbox um, based on searches that I created around topics that I that I need to know about. Um, you know, in this space, um, I also have a, an extensive network of people I've I know. You know, just from all the travels I've done, people whose opinions I, I trust um, and I know basically where they're coming from. So I can ask them, you know, if there's something going on in a specific market, I can, you know, just, you know, chat them up and say, hey, you know, what's going on with this? What do you, what, what's your perception of what this means? Um, things like that. So it's, it's really a, a combination of things. I mean, I also, I read academic journals. I read The Economist. I read a lot of news um, out there to basically stay informed of what's going on. Because one thing that's really important about the job, it's not just knowing like the specific sensitivity around uh, a specific piece of content like a for example a symbol that some person an artist put on a character's you know outfit things like that that's kind of the baseline knowledge that i constantly try and build up um i for example like symbols alone i have a stack of books that's at least a meter high of all these symbol dictionaries that i yeah and i'll kind of browse those for fun because that's kind of the nerd that i am um because i just i find it fascinating But um, so there's kind of that combination of kind of the baseline knowledge of of certain cultures that has been built up. And a lot of that is on the foundation of my geographer um, training and uh, that background. But the the other part of it is understanding the current market conditions, which is why I keep up on the news and and what's going on in the world. Because I need to know that when this game is supposed to release, let's say third quarter 2022, I need to have a sense of what is the market condition going to be like then. Because you never know. I mean, in some places, all it takes is, as we know, could take one election and things change. I mean, you know, in certain markets, I mean, laws can change. The whole, you know, what is acceptable, unacceptable could suddenly change. I mean, all of that kind of stuff um, can change depending on, or just even the general perception of video games might change either more favorably or less favorably, depending on what happens uh, in that particular market. So that's the kind of stuff I also have to keep track of. So um, so yeah, that's basically how I do it. It's just a, a huge combination of things of reading and staying up on all the, the uh, searches and whatnot, but also talking to people. That's really the best way to do it is just having a network of people who you can talk to about what's happening in their locale. And it sounds like a, a great deal of work on top of all the other work you already do. <laughs> It is a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. But the thing is, I, I love doing it, though. I love what I do. I'm, I'm just this hyper curious person. So I just I love absorbing information, um, you know, and it's it's the best way of all is just talking to people from other cultures. That's why I feel really thankful that um, over the last many years, I've been able to travel a lot when there's no pandemic. So typically, I'm traveling like 75, 80% of the year, speaking at a lot of conferences around the world. Um, but that gives that opportunity, you know, to talk to people face to face and learn more about their perspective on things and, you know, what they're struggling with as game developers and, you know, the issues that they're dealing with. So that all, all of that informs my work. You find a lot of studios are very open to the work you're, you're doing? Uh, today, yes. Um, when I first started doing this work, which was you know during my Microsoft days, that was over 27 years ago. Um, I, I basically peg it uh, that far back. So back in those days, it was challenging. It was a challenge because the the prevailing attitude at the time was like, hey, video games, we're edgy, we're cool, we can do stuff that's controversial. Um, and yeah, sure. I mean, that, but that's any creative media. It's not just games. It's like, yeah, you have the, the creative right and you should exercise that right to basically make what you want to make. But, you know, it's it's all about, you know, whether or not that is really going to be compatible with, um, with the local worldviews and the local, you know, expectations that you're going into. So, um, so yeah, it's, 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 but today it's gotten a lot easier. Obviously society has changed dramatically over the last 27 years. Um, the level of, of understanding I think has increased, especially among companies who understand that representation matters. It really matters. And you need to make the effort to, to go the distance, so to speak, in terms of making sure that your characters, your narrative, your environments, all of these things are accurate and respectful of the cultures that you're going to be leveraging even in a fantasy game 
you know, it matters there, obviously, because most fantasy and sci-fi games also get their inspiration from the real world. Pretty much every game does by in some aspect. And so we have to make sure that the representation is, you know, is we're really f- concentrating on that. So I find today, and especially this this punctuated within the last couple of years or so, I find that a lot of companies have suddenly woken up to the idea that this is really important. Um, and there's various social issues and, and you know, look, recent events that have caused them to be more, you know, uh, aware of how important this really is. And part of me is grateful for that, but also part of me is a bit resentful because I'm like, it should not have taken you this long to get it. You should have, you should have, you should have just, you know thought this way early on because honestly when I first started doing this work the argument I originally used was that we're doing this because we want to respect the player we want to respect who they are as a human being and make sure that that's we're representing them correctly in our games and making sure we're respectful within the narratives that we're pushing out that argument didn't go very far back then so I had to pivot my argument and make it a money argument so that's why I had to say, well, you know, if you culturalize your content, it actually maximizes the reach of your content because then it can go in more places around the world. And so therefore, if you, you know, if that's if you culturalize and make sure it's more compatible with other markets, that does happen to increase your revenue. And that argument resonated really strongly, especially with the higher ups in different companies. And so I'm like, okay, great. I found the key that opens up the door. But at the same time, I was like, I should not have had to make a money argument to make this important to people. Yeah, it's heartening to hear that things are getting better now. But it's like you say, it's it's disappointing that it took this long to kind of get to this point. Um, thank you for staying kind of fluid with uh, how you pushed to get this this stuff to happen, though. So <laughs> sometimes people come to you and you definitely had, and I told you so, that I bet you were holding in your back pocket. <laughs> I try not to say I told you so, but it, it happens sometimes. It's too. It's I told too, you this. You're stronger than me. Then <laughs> it's too good to pass up sometimes. Mm-hmm. All right, we got another question in the chat. Um, how do you make sure that you respectfully handle cultural assets in games, and how do you grow your own uh, grow your own expertise in these cultures that aren't your own? Part of that you can't be answered, but. Yeah, I, I answered a little bit of that, but that this question is a little more specific, and I think it's a it's a great question because I think there there's a certain understanding and awareness I have of v- various cultures around the world just by the longevity of the time I've been doing this work. Because again, reading a lot, talking to a lot of people, having an understanding of like kind of the baseline reaction that some cultures would have. But I'm obviously I'm not presumptuous to think that I'm going to represent the voice of a specific culture. So my job when I'm doing it is basically to flag something and say, I think this is going to be a problem in this culture based on my understanding, but the, then they need to take the next step. And sometimes they facilitate that through me and my work, but then oftentimes they I help them facilitate it through, you know, by themselves. But basically you need to find someone from that culture, an, an expert, a sensitivity reader, you know, some person who's going to represent that culture and, and be able to speak to the issues that you're addressing here because that's ultimately how you have to do it. You have to consult with them. And obviously we've seen games do a better job of this over the last few years. You know, there's great examples for like, for example, some games that have indigenous characters, like I think what Assassin's Creed 3, which then brought in someone from the Cherokee Nation to directly advise on how, you know, the Connor character should be represented, when the language they use, all of that kind of thing. I did a little bit of consulting work on Never Alone, for example, which was the game developed in direct partnership with the Inuit people up in, you know, Northern Canada, which was, you know, and basically they were the ones dictating to the development team, this is what, how it should be done. This is the language, this is the look, you know, and I think that when you're, when you make a game that is based on real cultures, um, and real geography, you really have to have that kind of direct engagement. To me, that's really the only best way to do it. Because my knowledge, I can definitely flag things and I can make people aware that, you know, they're going down a path that could be potentially problematic. But, you know, I, I like everybody else, I've got my limits to my knowledge. So basically I hit that wall and that's when I know either I need to reach out and talk to somebody locally, or I need to get the company to do the same, you know, or even take another step, which is like do specific sets of user research or focus groups Groups with that with a particular culture so that they can make sure they're not walking down a the wrong path you know with their creative uh, choices 
Are you seeing any sort of common mistakes between uh, developers that can be fixed with this expertise? Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, even though I do see companies that are more aware today than they were even five years ago, we still see tons of stereotype issues, lots and lots of stereotyping going on. Um, to me, that that's a combination of just, you know, part of its creative laziness, frankly. Um, it's not doing your due diligence. If you're going to create a character that's not from the culture that you represent, you know, then you need to do your due diligence to make sure you're making a character that is realistic to that culture and not, you know, not leveraging any tropes that are out there around that particular culture. It's really easy to do because it, it's something of a creative trap, you know, that we, we make these assumptions. And this it speaks to the fact that every single one of us, whether we like it or not, we are biased. I mean, because we all come from a specific culture, specific language, specific geography. And, you know, I think most of us, we overcome that bias with education. That's what the benefits of, of having an educational process. But that doesn't mean that all of those biases we might have are just, and I'm when I say bias, I'm not talking about like active bias. Like I'm actually thinking about doing something that's going to be, you know, problematic. I'm just thinking, I'm just saying that the bias is there because that blocks us from having that full understanding of what other choices might be. If you're going to make us like a specific character, say a character from East Asia, you know, what are my choices there? Well, East Asian culture is, is dramatically diverse. When you look at, you know, China, Korea, Japan, you know, other places throughout the region, and even within those countries, it's quite diverse. So you really have to dig deep and understand, you know, what, what do you want to, what do you want to represent in that from that particular culture um and again speaking to the point about um about uh fantasy and sci-fi games sometimes game developers because a lot of our games tend to be set in a fictional universe we also have to be really careful because those things bleed over all the time those choices are also um, just as complicated because we often look to the real world to set up allegories in our sci-fi or fantasy universe whether it's narrative allegory or visual allegory um, but those allegories have an origin point. They have an inspiration in the real world. And we need to make sure what I, that we have sufficient, what I call allegorical distance so that the original inspiration isn't too obvious to what actually shows up in the game. Um, so I think that was a long answer. <laughs> Sorry. It was a really good answer because I feel like you're covering a lot of important points and that many of us, without even realizing it, carry these little biases, these little things we don't, maybe we didn't pick up on that we we feel or turns of phrase we use or like you say the 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 inspirations for some of these character styles or types or things like that in, in our fantasy mediums and things like that we haven't really looked at so it, to your point it's very important to kind of examine these things before we kind of trot out something harmful again without mm -hmm. really thinking about it yeah all right, we got another question here from the audience. Uh, uh, how can someone graduating high school or university today best seek out their own incredible confluence of everything I love? <laughs> it's that is a great question. I mean, yeah. par, part of it, like I kind of alluded to earlier, for, in my case, was a happy accident. But but the but point is, though, I never lost track of what I love. And, you know, I always had that that uh, the, I kind of wear my interests on my sleeve, so to speak. So like my my love of Star Wars never went away. It's like I, you know, my because I that's why I wanted to be an artist at Lucasfilm just so I could work on a Star Wars movie. That was the whole reason. And of course, I didn't get that chance, but I did years later, I did work on Star Wars, the Old Republic for Bioware for four years. So, you know, in that case, the circle was now complete. I actually got to work on something Star Wars, not in the same capacity I imagined when I was in high school, but I still got to work on it. So that's one of those just serendipitous things about your life path and career that I always find interesting is that you have no idea whether or not these things are going to come back along your path at some point in the future. Um, you know, it is important to kind of choose a path because if you got to be on a path. That's the important part. You got to be going in a direction, but you have to be open to how that could change. And, and you know, I, I do mentor a lot of people in this industry, a lot of young people who want to come into this industry. And one of the, the biggest challenges I find, but I think it's also natural with that age, is that you have ver you're very focused on exactly what you want to achieve. I want to be the chief designer on X franchise, for example. I want to be the lead designer at this 
company. That's great. And I think people should have specific goals like that, but you got to be really open and flexible to other stuff that comes your way. Um, because I, I never imagined when I was in high school being a geographer, I never imagined working on video games, even though I love video games. I was seven years old when Pong showed up in the store. So that was my first video game. And I've loved games ever since. But um, I never imagined any of this happening at all. It was not ever, even close on my radar. And yet it was mainly because as the choices came along, I was open to the idea that like, okay, yeah, I want to do that. I want to do this. Um, like I, you know, I left Microsoft in 2005, even though I had built my own team there, I created my own job there. I was getting paid very well with good benefits and all of that, but I left because it just, I felt like my job was done there. I had done basically what I needed to do at the company. And now I wanted to see if other companies want to do this too. And I wanted to also focus almost exclusively on games, which is another reason I left because then it would give me the ability as a self-employed person to focus on what I wanted to focus on. And a lot of people thought I was insane. Why would I possibly leave a good job like that, that I created at a company like Microsoft and go off and become, you know, an entrepreneur, which is, you know, almost a death sentence for some. And, but it was because I just had that driving desire to, to take my knowledge and do something different with it. And so I think you have to take, be willing to take risks like that and be willing to be open to whatever comes along your way. And don't be afraid, you know, if you have a great opportunity that comes your way that might be a little divergent from the path you were imagining, I would encourage you to take it because you never know how that's going to come back. And the reality is that everything you do, no matter what job it is, no matter what path you're taking, you are building up experience, life experience and work experience that ultimately could be useful down the road. So I just encourage you to just keep your eyes open and, you know because some people too many people get blinded by this you know, like this really solid focus yeah you get too focused on one thing so it's kind of like allowing yourself to broaden that experience like, yeah see, see you all right probably have time for one more question of course it's slipped on down the list <laughs> dare you sneak off on me all right um <laughs> We're actually going to touch on some of your Global Game Jam stuff now. Yeah. I talk about this globalization stuff all day. But <laughs> a lot of solo game devs struggle with matchmaking and forming teams. A lot of people use Game Jams as a platform for this, but any of these teams collapse after the event. With yeah. your answer, Global Game Jam, um, is there a way to provide help to game devs on finding the right people to work with? That is a fantastic question. That is something that we're trying to work on because we know that that is a real problem. And we know mm -hmm. that became more punctuated last year because last year was the first time we did a virtual global game jam. Um, we did GGJ Next, which is our event for younger people last summer in July. That was the first time we ever did a virtual jam. And then of course, in January this year is when we did a virtual jam as well. And well, GGJ Next actually starts in five days this year. And again, that's a virtual format. And that really raised the profile on how what a struggle it is for solo devs to get connected to a team. Because obviously when you're on site, you're at, you're at a location, it's a lot easier, even though then it can be somewhat challenging for people because there's always that, that little part after after the, the theme is announced and people kind of go their separate ways to you start working on their game you know there's always kind of that little forum where you have the the solo people saying hey i'm you know i can do this you know does anyone need me on their team and usually those people get paired off which is great they get attached to a team but if you're virtual or if you're just kind of out there it's it is tough to do that and so we've been trying to think of ways to make it a lot easier so that we kind of have i don't know i don't want to call it matchmaking nothing like that but basically a way so that teams can say hey this is what we need and you also have a pool of people to say this is what I do you know to make it a lot easier especially in a virtual jam um, because that just makes it super challenging because you're not you don't have any like necessarily com communal space and if you're like in a discord channel or something it's just a lot of noise to kind of figure out what's going on so the short answer is that we're, we, we're aware of this problem and we're trying to fix it. Um, right now, it's, it's not an easy fix, um, but I'm glad you raised the question though. All right. And I think that's about all we have time for today. We're down to that last minute. So um, Kate, thank you so, so much for coming out and talking with us today. It was fascinating to listen to your work. Uh, definitely gonna keep following up on what you're doing from here on out. 
Well, thank you. Yeah, this was great. Yeah, I mean, we could talk for hours on <laughs> this, yeah. this subject. I will but, take yeah, you up on that someday. And and I'm more than happy. People want to reach out to me. I'm pretty easy to find on Twitter and elsewhere if you want to reach out to me. And uh, if you have additional questions, don't hesitate. You know, especially, you know, if you're looking to get into the industry, this is, this is how you start. You ask questions and don't be shy. Mm-hmm. All right. With that, thanks a lot for coming out, folks. Enjoy the rest of GDC 2021.